Shed Radio Hour is supported by Squarespace. Squarespace, providing tools that help people showcase their passions with a customizable landing page, website, or online store. Squarespace also offers domains, hosting, and 24-7 support. Learn more at squarespace.com trh. Hey, everyone. It's Guy here. Just a quick note to tell you that we are, uh, unfortunately, we are away this week. We're at the TED conference looking for great new talks for upcoming shows. But in the meantime, uh, take a listen to this one from our archives. It's called The Money Paradox. And it's about the strange ways that money can motivate and trick and satisfy and even disappoint us. Here it is. This is the TED Radio Hour. Each week, groundbreaking TED Talks. TED Talks. Uh, TED. TED. Technology. Entertainment. Design. Design. Is that really what it stands for? <laughs> I've never known that. Delivered it, at TED it. conferences around the it's world. The gift of the human imagination. We've had to believe in impossible things. The true nature of reality beckons from just beyond. Those talks, those ideas, adapted for radio. From NPR. Guy Raz. And today on the show, the money paradox. Ideas around the way money captures all the contradictions of human psychology and why our brains might actually be built to deal with money very, very badly. So a couple of years ago, a group of psychologists wanted to know why money makes us behave in all sorts of weird ways. So they started with a question. What makes humans special? What makes us unique? Uh, could, you, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, so I'm Laurie Santos. I'm a professor of psychology at Yale University, and I run the Yale Comparative Cognition Laboratory. Okay, the question again? What makes humans special? What makes us unique? And one of the ways we try to get at that question is to study how other animals think about the world, uh, in particular how monkeys think about the world. Mm, Monkeys? (laughs) Yeah. Because they're so similar to us? Yeah, we study monkeys for a couple reasons. Um, I'm not inherently interested in how monkeys think. I'm really interested in using them as a window to figure out how humans think. And Lori's work is about looking through that little monkey-shaped window and asking why humans make such big mistakes with money. Why we generate recessions and depressions and bankruptcy and Ponzi schemes and credit card debt. Yeah, we're like, we're we're kind of (laughs) dumb. Like we make dumb. And that's kind of the puzzle, right? Is like sometimes our errors are systematic and predictable, even in the face of bad consequences. Um, And that makes them really curious to a psychologist like me. Why is it that we keep doing dumb things in the face of bad consequences? Okay, to answer that question, Let's head to the TED stage with Lori Santos. You know, we're the smartest thing out there. Why can't we figure this out? In some sense, where do our mistakes really come from? And having thought about this a little bit, I see a couple different possibilities. One possibility is, in some sense, it's not really our fault. Because we're a smart species, we can actually create all kinds of environments that are super, super complicated, sometimes too complicated for us to even actually understand, even though we've actually created them. We create financial markets that are super complex. We create mortgage terms that we can't actually deal with. And of course, if we are put in environments where we can't deal with it, in some sense, it makes sense that we actually might mess certain things up. If this was the case, we'd have a really easy solution to the problem of human error. We'd actually just say, okay, let's figure out the kinds of technologies we can't deal with, the kinds of environments that are bad, get rid of those, design things better, and we should be the noble species that we expect ourselves to be. But there's another possibility that I find a little bit more worrying, which is maybe it's not our environments that are messed up. Maybe it's actually us that's designed badly. So to test this theory out, whether the mistakes we make with money are somehow a flaw in our design, Lori decided to introduce monkeys to money. It sounds like a strange, a strange yeah. concept, right? Putting monkeys and money together, yeah. but t- turns out not so strange. So h- how do you how do you make a monkey uh, use money? Well, uh, we weren't sure how we could make monkeys use money when we first started these studies. Um, And so we said, well, maybe we could give the monkeys something that worked like money. You know, if we gave them little tokens that worked like coins, would they treat it like money? Would they trade these tokens for food? So you're a monkey, right? And you've got this little metal token. And an experimenter walks up to your cage with a grace. 
<laughs> and if you're the monkey, you kind of nudge over and see what you can do to get the grape. And if the experimenter grabs the token from you, the monkeys quickly learn, aha, I guess I just give them these tokens and I can get access for food. Okay, there you go. Monkey money. You give me a token, I give you a grape, and then, just to make it a little more interesting, Lori and her team created a diversified monkey marketplace. They pick things like, you know, fruit roll-ups and, and cereal. and Because you think bananas, right? Yeah, the monkeys do. They like bananas, but grapes are pretty high. Huh. Um, our monkeys are a bit spoiled. And so over the course of a day, she'd have different experimenters sell the monkeys food at different prices. By changing the amount of food that each experimenter gave. So you send one guy into the cage, monkey gives him one token, monkey gets one grape. But then you send in a second guy, monkey gives him one token, and monkey gets two grapes for a token. Okay, so two different guys, both charging one token, but one gives you one grape, the other gives you two. So the monkeys can actually learn who got the better deal. And so Lori's question was, do they do the rational thing? So do they go for the most food? Do they go for the best prices? Do they go for the best option, even over risk? And the surprising thing was in all of those cases, the monkeys seemed pretty rational. So if an experimenter started offering more than they were offering on previous trials, um, the monkeys liked that. They considered it like a sale and would shop more at that human experimenter. Um, and the monkeys also took into account uh, how risky the person was if the person did something different from trial to trial, didn't give what they said they were going to give, um, the, then the monkeys took that into account on future trials as well. Okay, this does not sound dumb to me. This sounds very smart. This sounds pretty smart. And I guess the, the message that we got pretty quickly was that the monkeys are smart in lots of the same cases that humans are smart. I mean, these are the sorts of rational things that humans do in their own markets. Uh, what we were really interested in, though, was whether the monkeys would show the same errors that humans show in the markets too. So are they irrational in the cases where humans are irrational? And so to answer that question, the researchers decided to test out something called prospect theory on the monkeys. And prospect theory in simple terms says that humans are wired to avoid risk, specifically losses. Anyway, Lori's team wanted to figure out if monkeys, like humans, make irrational decisions because they are afraid to lose stuff. So they went back to the monkey lab. And so here's what the monkeys might face. They might get a choice between an experimenter who looks like he's going to give three pieces of food. But in the end, when the monkey trades with him, he takes one away and gives the monkeys only two. So two pieces of food are pretty good, but the monkeys get less than they expect. We'd compare how the monkeys did with this guy versus a different guy who started off with one piece of food. But that guy would then give an extra one that the monkeys didn't expect. So if you're being rational, you shouldn't care between the two guys. They each give you two. You should just kind of shop at them at chance. Who cares? They're giving you the same amount. But if you're paying attention to the reference point, what you started with, the first guy seems like a bad deal. You know, he took one away. You thought you were going to get three, and you only got two. And what we find is that the monkeys pay attention to what humans pay attention to, which is the status quo. If you're getting less than you expect, it seems like a bad deal, even if the overall absolute amount that you get is still pretty good. So, I mean, they, they become totally irrational. That's right. Just in the sense that what, what an economist would say the monkeys should like is just the absolute amount of food they get. It doesn't matter what they thought they were going to get. But we saw an even more striking effect, not with bonuses, but with losses. So these are cases where the monkeys think they're going to get a lot of food and they get less. And what we found is that just like humans, the monkeys are averse to losses. So they tend to avoid guys who give them less than they expect, even in cases where that guy is overall giving them the same amount of food. Okay, so you're saying that that, that monkey part of us, right, that, that hasn't changed, it hasn't evolved? Yeah, I think that is one thing you can learn from our work is that whatever strategies we're using for money, especially those strategies that we share with monkeys, those kinds of strategies can't be built in for money per se. They're not for markets or for credit cards. They're just strategies that we had sitting around in our primate brain that we're adapting to money. And that might mean that they lead us astray. What do we know about other old strategies like this? Well, one thing we know is that they tend to be really hard to overcome. 
You know, think of our evolutionary predilection for eating sweet things, fatty things like cheesecake. We can't just shut that off. We can't just look at the dessert cart and say, no, 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 that, that looks disgusting to me. We're just built differently. We're going to perceive it as a good thing to go after. My guess is that the same thing is going to be true when humans are perceiving different financial decisions. When you're watching your stocks plummet into the red, when you're watching your house price go down, you're not going to be able to see that in anything but old evolutionary terms. This means that the biases that lead Lead investors to do badly that lead to the foreclosure crisis are going to be really hard to overcome. So that's the bad news. Question is, is there any good news? I'm supposed to be up here telling you the good news. Well, the good news, I think, is humans are not only smart, we're really inspirationally smart to the rest of the animals in the biological kingdom. We're so good at overcoming our biological limitations. You know, I flew over here in an airplane. I didn't have to try to flap my wings. I'm wearing contact lenses now so that I can see all of you. I don't have to rely on my own nearsightedness. We actually have all of these cases where we overcome our biological limitations through technology and other means seemingly pretty easily. But we have to recognize that we have those limitations. And here's the rub. It was Camus who once said that man is the only species who refuses to be what he really is. But the irony is that it might only be in recognizing our limitations that we can really actually overcome them. The hope is that you all will think about your limitations not necessarily as unovercomable, but to recognize them, accept them, and then use the world of design to actually figure them out. That might be the only way that we will really be able to achieve our own human potential and really be the noble species uh, we hope to all be. Thank you. Laurie Santos runs the Comparative Cognition Laboratory at Yale. Her full talk is at ted.npr.org. I guess the moral of the story is you never want to give a credit card to a monkey. That, that might be a good moral of the story. Um, whether or not they'd pay you back, I'm, I'm not sure. We don't have empirical evidence over it, but my guess is it probably look pretty bad. Especially not with a high interest rate, you know? Exactly, yep, yep. So Keith, you've worked on some of this with Lori? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we've done a lot of work together on capuchins and money. This is Keith Chen. He's a friend of Lori's from college. and uh, I'm an associate professor of economics uh, here at UCLA in the Anderson School. But one of the things Keith noticed working with those monkeys is that it's very, very difficult to get them to save for the future. And it's hard to get certain people to save for the future, too, but only certain people. So, you know, the recent financial crisis really kind of hit home with this, like, really, really stark fact, which is... There are countries around the world that just seem similar on so many dimensions, but which display radically different savings behavior. And Keith is talking about rich countries, OECD countries, with stable governments, stable economies, good education systems, but whose citizens do not save money in the same way. So there can be, in any given year, an OECD country which is saving um, over 25% of its GDP, 40% of its GDP. So like Japan or China or the Scandinavian countries, while there are other ones... You know, like the United States, for example, that, that barely cracks 10%. So the issue for Keith, and for a lot of economists who've been looking at this issue for decades, is why? Why do we see such radically different savings behavior um, across countries? Keith was exploring just that question when he came up with kind of a crazy idea that directly connects the way you save money with the language you speak. We'll explain in a moment. I'm Guy Raz, and this is the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, everyone. Just a quick thanks to two of our sponsors who help make this podcast possible. First to Stamps.com. Stamps.com helps businesses avoid time-consuming trips to the post office. You can use your own computer and printer to print official U.S. postage for any letter or package. Then the mail carrier picks it up. No more wasting money on expensive postage meters. And right now, sign up for Stamps.com and use the promo code NPR for a special offer, a four-week trial, plus postage and a digital scale. Go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone, and type in NPR. Thanks also to LearnVest. LearnVest is an online financial advice company focused on empowering people nationwide to make smart decisions with 
their money. If you want to know how to aggressively pay down your student loans, LearnVest can help with that. If you want to know how much you should put aside for savings, they can help with that too. Or how much you should contribute to your retirement account, yep, that too. LearnVest will create a custom financial plan to answer those questions. Plus, they pair you with a financial planner to help keep you on track. To see a sample plan and get a $50 credit, go to LearnVest.com slash Radio Hour. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. Our show today, The Money Paradox, ideas around why money has so much influence on our behavior. So a moment ago, we met Keith Chen. He's an economist. Yeah. So uh, what I am more specifically is a behavioral economist. And most importantly, one of the the primary things I study is is how people make decisions about uh, really, really far off events. So how is it that I bring myself to, to save for retirement, even if that's 35 years away? Okay. So for a long time, economists have grappled with a mystery. Why are, say, Americans or Greeks or the British so bad at saving money compared with the Chinese or the Finns? So why is it that the Chinese, the the Scandinavians and the Japanese save so much? What I started to notice as an economist was that all of these countries, which are outliers to an economist, are also outliers to linguists when they think about languages that don't kind of strictly grammaticalize the difference between the future and the present. And, and so it started to click in my mind that, wow, you know, can this just be a coincidence or, or, or is there a deeper pattern here? Here's how Keith explained it from the TED stage. So, for example, if I'm speaking in English, I have to speak grammatically differently if I'm talking about past rain, it rained yesterday, current rain, it is raining now, or future rain, it will rain tomorrow. Notice that English requires a lot more information with respect to the timing of events. Why? Because I have to consider that and I have to modify what I'm saying to say it will rain it's, or, I'm, or it's going to rain. It's simply not permissible in English to say it rain tomorrow. In contrast to that, that's almost exactly what you would say in Chinese. A Chinese speaker can basically say something that sounds very strange to an English speaker's ears. They can say, yesterday it rained, now it rained, tomorrow it rained. In some deep sense, Chinese doesn't divide up the time spectrum in the same way that English forces us to constantly do uh, in order to speak correctly. And to linguists, this means that Chinese is a futureless language. English, on the other hand, is a future language, which means that time constantly intrudes into our speech in all kinds of ways. So, for example, if you asked me, um, you know, Keith, uh, how long can we keep speaking? Um, yeah, how long? <laughs> so, you know, we can keep, we can keep going for hours. But, uh, but you know, I have some graduate students back, mm. uh, back waiting for me back in my office. Um, it's perfectly natural if we were speaking Mandarin Chinese with each other for me to say, um, you know, I'm sorry, we, we, we kind of have to wrap this up. Uh, I meet with student in an hour. Like, it's, hmm. it, that, that doesn't sound strange at all to a Chinese speaker here. And that led Keith to an intriguing hypothesis. Could how you speak about time affect the way you think about money? You speak English, a futured language, and what that means is that every time you discuss the future or any kind of a future event, grammatically you're forced to cleave that from the present and treat it as if it's something viscerally different. Now, suppose that that visceral difference makes you subtly disassociate the future from the present every time you speak. If that's true, and it makes the future feel like something more distant and more different from the present, that's going to make it harder to save. If, on the other hand, you speak a futureless language, the present and the future, you speak about them identically. If that subtly nudges you to feel about them identically, that's going to make it easier to save. Okay, so to test this theory out, Keith gathered up millions of data points, data from health and lifestyle surveys taken from around the world. And then he controlled for religion, sex, and family size. Imagine uh, two families have exactly the same number of children. The heads of households are exactly the same age. They've uh, gotten exactly the same number of years of education, have the same type of college degree. They find themselves in the same income decile. Um, They live within miles of each other. Um, But the languages that these two families speak at home, one of these languages um, 
equates the future and the present, and one of these languages separates the future and the present in their grammar. Now, uh, even after all of this granular level of control, uh, do futureless language speakers seem to save more? Yes. Futureless language speakers, even after this level of control, are 30% more likely to report having saved in any given year. Does this have cumulative effects? Yes. By the time they retire, futureless language speakers holding constant their income are going to retire with 25% more in savings. Can we push this data even further? Yes. Think about smoking, for example. Smoking is, in some deep sense, negative savings. Right? If savings is current pain in exchange for future pleasure, smoking is just the opposite. It's current pleasure in exchange for future pain. What we should expect, then, is the opposite effect, and that's exactly what we find. Futureless language speakers are 20 to 24 percent less likely to be smoking in a given point in time compared to identical families, and they're going to be 13 to 70 percent less likely to be obese by the time they retire, and they're going to report being 21 percent more likely to have used a condom in their last sexual encounter. I could go on and on with the list of differences that you can find. It's almost impossible not to find a, a savings behavior for which this strong effect isn't present. That is insane. I mean, that is crazy <laughs> to me that the language somebody speaks can yeah, determine. But, I mean, you know, when you think about it, it, it can make perfect sense. Like, it's it's a really hard problem to think about. Um, you know, money issues are difficult. Like, uh, you know, do I save in a Roth? Do I save in a standard 401k? Like, how do I, how much should I save? You know, should I save in stocks? Should I save in bonds? And it just sounds like way out there, like way out into the future. Yeah, exactly. It's it's far away. It's abstract. It's, it's difficult for you to visualize um, exactly why you're saving now. So, like, what could... People who have, you know, futured language, like how, how do you fix it? Like how do you get them to save better if like like baked into the language is this problem? Yeah, so so my ultimate goal with a lot of this research is to really uncover the subtle things which nudge us to thinking about problems in one way or the other. And um, there's actually some fascinating work by a psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania, who he got a company to do some interesting things to people's 401k forms. So you go in to work one day and they ask you, how much of your uh, salary would you like set aside for your retirement account? And what this psychologist did was, uh, in one condition, he put your picture from the kind of corporate Facebook uh, in the upper right-hand side of the form. That he did to half of the people. To the other half of the people, he put an aged version of your picture, a digitally aged version of your picture, in the upper right-hand side of the form. And what he found is that people who had to stare at their future selves saved a lot more than people who were staring at their current selves while making this decision. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> so uh, I would certainly never recommend that we abandon English, for example, for Finnish or something like that. Mm. But I think that, that becoming more aware and understanding exactly why it is that we allow kind of subtle nudges of, of our language to, to kind of affect our decision making in the end will result in tools that will help us kind of be better stewards of our own futures. Keith Chen, a lot of economists believe that his groundbreaking research could change the way we think about savings. Check out his full talk at TED.com. So the way we behave when it comes to money includes all kinds of contradictions, right? Like, like being really cautious with our money one day and then really risky with it on another day or being generous sometimes, and then really greedy at other times. And that tension is what led Paul Piff to embark on a very unusual experiment. He's a psychologist at Berkeley. What I do is study what makes people cooperative and kind toward others versus selfish and greedy. And in a lot of his studies, he asks, are rich people meaner than the rest of us? And I've always wanted to run a study on what makes people drive the way that they do. Paul and his colleagues tested an idea that you might already know instinctively that people who drive really expensive cars are often the biggest jerks on the road. And we, we actually literally had coders hiding behind bushes, coding the kind of cars that were coming down the roadway. So how expensive is this car? And they were coding whether the driver of that car proceeds to stop this is just some, some like, dude from your lab at the, at the crosswalk? Some dude from our lab who's posing as a pedestrian waiting to cross at a crosswalk of a busy roadway. 
Now, this is in California, where if you do not stop for a pedestrian at a crosswalk, you're breaking the law. And what we found was that 50% of those most expensive vehicles broke the law, whereas none, zero, not a single one of those least expensive cars did so. Okay, so what does this prove anyway? Well, it turns out you can take almost anyone, put them in a lab, and in just a few minutes, you can make them feel and act like they are both rich and mean. Here's Paul Piff on the TED stage. I want you to, for a moment, think about playing a game of Monopoly, except this game's been rigged, and you've got the upper hand. And as you think about that experience, I want you to ask yourself, how might that experience of being a privileged player in a rigged game change the way that you think about yourself and regard that other player? So we ran a study on the UC Berkeley campus to look at exactly that question. We brought in more than 100 pairs of strangers into the lab. Is it my role? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to pardon the sound quality in some cases because these were hidden cameras. I'll buy it. With the flip of a coin, we randomly assigned one of the two to be a rich player in a rigged game. I'm going to build. They got two times as much money. And they got to roll both dice instead of one, so they got to move around the board a lot more. <laughs> and just to stick it to the poor player, the rich player gets to move the Rolls Royce around, which is that really desirable, luxurious piece. Oh, yeah. Whereas the poor player's got to move that measly little shoe. No one wants that piece. Or the thimble. Who likes the thimble? No one wants, Nobody the, wants thimble. the thimble. No. The rich player started to move around the board louder, literally smacking the board with their piece as he went around. Mm. You're more likely to see signs of dominance and displays of power and celebration among the rich players. Wait, did you get, how many 500s did you have? Just one. Are you serious? Yeah. I have three. <laughs> I don't know why they gave me so much. And here's what I think was really, really interesting, is that at the end of the 15 minutes, we asked the players to talk about their experience during the game. And when the rich players talked about why they'd inevitably won in this rigged game of Monopoly, <laughs> they talked about what they'd done to buy those different properties and earn their success in the game. So they're like, I won because I'm awesome. I won because I'm awesome, because wow. I know how to play this game, because I've played this <laughs> game before. Nobody said I was lucky? A few people said that they got lucky rolls of the dice, but very few people talk about the fact that it was that flip of a coin that got them into that initial position of privilege. What we've been finding across dozens of studies and thousands of participants across this country is that as a person's levels of wealth increase, their feelings of compassion and empathy go down, and their feelings of entitlement, of deservingness, and their ideology of self-interest increases. In one of the studies, we bring in rich and poor members of the community into the lab and give each of them the equivalent of $10. We told the participants that they could keep these $10 for themselves or they could share a portion of it with a stranger who's totally anonymous and we just monitor how much people give. Individuals who made $25,000, sometimes under $15,000 a year gave 44% more of their money to this stranger than did individuals making $150,000, $200,000 a year. That's unbelievable. I mean, it just seems counterintuitive. Yeah, so for the last 60 or 70 years, there's been a trend that people have documented. Lower income households give proportionately more of their incomes to charity than higher income households. So proportionately speaking, the less well off you are, the more charitable you are. Okay, but how does that happen? I mean, how does how does money change you? Like say, like say you come into a lot of it when you're like, you know, 50. I mean, what would happen? Well, it would, for one, mean that you can afford a different kind of home. Maybe it means you can afford a bigger home where the people in your family would all occupy separate bedrooms. You'll have a bigger yard, potentially, or more space between your house and other people's homes. When you go to work, you may be less likely to take that bus or that carpool. When you get to work, you may be more likely to have a position of someone who's, say, a 
overseer of other people as opposed to someone who works with one another in teams. And with that sort of increased self-focus, that increased control, you become less attuned to other people in your environment, less cooperative, less ethical, a whole slew of other things. We ran another study where we looked at whether people would be inclined to take candy from a jar of candy that we explicitly identified as being reserved for children. <laughs> participating, I'm not kidding, I know it sounds like I'm making a joke. We explicitly told participants, this jar of candy is for children participating in a developmental lab nearby. They're in studies, this is for them, and we just monitored how much candy participants took. Participants who felt rich took two times as much candy as participants who felt poor. Now, I don't mean to suggest that it's only wealthy people who show these patterns of behavior. Not at all. In fact, I think that we all, in our day-to-day, minute-by-minute lives, struggle with these competing motivations of when or if to put our own interests above the interests of other people. And that's understandable because... The American dream is an idea in which we all have an equal opportunity to succeed and prosper. And a piece of that means that sometimes you need to put your own interests above the interests and well-being of other people around you. When you think about your, your own research on this, it's like a, it's a part of you sort of like, I don't know, like disappointed in human behavior? I don't know. You know, disappointment's not necessarily the right word because I think a lot of the effects that we're documenting are understandable. And what's important to recognize is that there are a lot of other things that shape how compassionate and generous a person is. Their gender, their ethnicity, the social groups they belong to, how they were raised. Money is one of those factors, but it's not the only one. You know, you know, I think what's what's interesting about your research is that, I mean, it says that we're all basically like malleable, and rich people are malleable too, right? I mean, they can they can change and pretty quickly. Absolutely. Now we found in our own laboratory work, and this has been uh, replicated elsewhere and extended elsewhere, that when we bring wealthy people in, and through even small nudges, simple reminders, a reminder of the needs of others, their levels of empathy compassion, and charity go up. In one study, we had people watch a brief video, just 46 seconds long, about childhood poverty. And after watching that, we looked at how willing people were to offer up their own time to a stranger presented to them in the lab who was in distress. After watching this video, an hour later, rich people became just as generous of their own time to help out this other person, a stranger, as someone who's poor, suggesting that these differences are not innate or categorical, but are so malleable to slight changes in people's values and little nudges of compassion and bumps of empathy. Thank you. Paul Piff, he's a social psychologist at the University of California, Berkeley. You can check out his entire talk at TED.com. More on the money paradox in a moment. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, everyone. Just a quick thanks to one of our sponsors that helps keep this podcast going. Netflix presenting Cooked, the Netflix original documentary series from best-selling author Michael Pollan and Oscar-winning filmmaker Alex Gibney. The four-part series examines the four natural elements, fire, water, air, and earth, and how they transform raw ingredients into delicious dishes. Cooked explores our primal human need to cook and issues a clarion call for a return to the kitchen to reclaim lost traditions and restore balance to our lives. All episodes of Cooked are now streaming only on Netflix. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And today's show, The Money Paradox. Here's the thing. We like money. We love money. We love incentives. They get our attention. 
This is the writer Daniel Pink, and he wrote a book about what motivates humans. It's called Drive. Is money the best motivator for encouraging high performance? And the, in answer, all tasks? Is... the answer is absolutely not. Not? Absolutely How not. How can in that all be? Things. Well, here's the thing. It's the same. This is actually simpler than it seems at the outset. There's a certain kind of motivator that we use in organizations, in schools, in our lives. I call it an if-then motivator. If you do this, then you get that. If you do this, then you get that. So give me an example. What do you mean? Oh, okay. Let's say you want somebody to stuff envelopes. Okay. Okay. You're trying to motivate somebody to stuff envelopes. Right. Not particularly interesting. No. Not particularly cognitively complex. No. Pay them per envelope. Okay. Absolutely no question about that. You got to pay them per envelope. That's a way to motivate yes. them to do the job. Because they'll do more envelopes. Right. And here's the thing. And this is there's some nuance here. But what if you come across something a little harder than stuffing envelopes? Like, like what if you come across the candle problem? What it involves is you give people three things. You give them a candle, you give them some matches, and you give them a box of tacks. A candle, some matches, and a box of tacks. That's it. <laughs> so we tried this experiment with a few people. We gave them the candle problem. Wait, wait, wait. No, put it the question there. is, you need to affix the candle to a wall so that the wax doesn't drip onto the table. Which it will not drip into uh, the table. So you can use the, the thumbtacks and and to to sort of like press it up against the wall. Lighting a candle and wetting this entire side of the candle. When I did this, I said, "Okay, I got this." Um, what you need to do is you need to light the matches, melt the side of the candle, fix it with the side oh, right, right, itself, gotcha. so it becomes sticky, and then use that stickiness to adhere the candle to the wall. All right. So it's melting the oh candle. Oh my God, my fingers. <laughs> burn your fingers. I don't think it's gonna work. It just doesn't work. Is it gonna hold? Because the candle immediately falls off the wall. Aww. And so what people eventually do, and most people end up solving the problem, is that they realize that what looks to be three elements, what about getting rid of the box of tacks, the candle, and the matches, is actually four elements. I think the box is helpful as a wax catcher. I think that's its primary purpose. I agree. The tacks are a separate element. And so what they do is they position the candle in the box. Could we support the candle in the box? And use the tacks to tack the box onto the wall. Onto the wall. And then use the box as the catcher of the wax. Right. And that allows the candle to be affixed to the wall without dripping wax onto the table. Candle. Light the candle. I'm trying. Oh! Oh, there you go. Okay, this is not so simple. You have to literally think outside the box. So what happens if you add a little bit of money to the equation? Well, the psychologist Sam Glucksberg did just that. He tried it back in the 1960s, which is a story that Dan Pink told on the TED stage. This shows the power of incentives. Here's what he did. He gathered his participants and he said, I'm going to time you how quickly you can solve this problem. To one group, he said, I'm going to time you to establish norms, averages for how long it typically takes someone to solve this sort of problem. To the second group, he offered rewards. He said, if you're in the top 25% of the fastest times, you get $5. If you're the fastest of everyone, we're testing here today, you get $20. Question, how much faster did this group solve the problem? Answer, it took them on average three and a half minutes longer. Three and a half minutes longer. Now this makes no sense, right? If you want people to perform better, you reward them, right? Bonuses, commissions, their own reality show, incentivize them. That's how business works, but that's not happening here. You've got an incentive designed to sharpen thinking and accelerate creativity, and it does just the opposite. It dulls thinking and blocks creativity. And what's interesting about this experiment is that it's not an aberration. This has been replicated over and over and over again for nearly 40 years. These contingent motivators, if you do this, then you get that, work in some circumstances, but for a lot of tasks, they actually either don't work or often they do harm. What explains that? What explains it is the power of if-then rewards and the power of these kinds of incentives. We love them. They get our attention, okay? Our eyes widen, and but more important, our focus narrows. That's actually good for some things, but for a creative problem, it actually inhibits you. It's you, actually a bad incentive. Right. To offer money in this case is a bad thing. Yeah. 
And this idea has been tested in all sorts of ways at the London School of Economics, at MIT, Carnegie Mellon, the University of Chicago, the list goes on and on. And every single experiment came up with the same answer, that money actually narrows our focus and restricts our creativity. Let me tell you why this is so important. That routine, rule-based, left-brain work, certain kinds of accounting, certain kinds of financial analysis, certain kinds of computer programming has become fairly easy to outsource, fairly easy to automate. Software can do it faster. Low-cost providers around the world can do it cheaper. So what really matters are the more right-brain, creative, conceptual kinds of abilities. Think about your own work. Everybody in this room is dealing with their own version of the candle problem. And for candle problems of any kind, the solution is not to entice people with a sweeter carrot or threaten them with a sharper stick. We need a whole new approach. The good news about all this is that the scientists who've been studying motivation have given us this new approach. It's an approach built much more around intrinsic motivation, around the desire to do things because they matter, because we like it, because they're interesting, because they're part of something important. And to my mind, that new operating system for our businesses revolves around three elements. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy, the urge to direct our own lives. Mastery, the desire to get better and better at something that matters. And purpose, the yearning to do what we do in the service of something larger than ourselves. But I mean, like, like that feeling of ownership, mm -hmm. which is great, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we, everybody wants it, mm -hmm. like, but like that doesn't, that doesn't pay for your mortgage or your That's why I say you've got to get the money right at the threshold. Yeah. Guy, you know what? I'm going to give you full autonomy over everything that okay. you do. I take it. I'm going to talk to you every single day about how important what you do is each day contributes to this beloved public radio network yeah. and to the entertainment and edification of people around the country. Yeah. But I'm going to pay you $5,000 a year. That's mm. not going to work. No. Right. Get the money right as a threshold, then move on to these other things. If we've known this, ah, yeah. So, like, why are we where we are? That's a really important question, and it's, it's frustrating. And I think in business in, in particular, first of all, there are some signs that it's changing, and it's changing in smaller companies and in newer companies, okay? But if there is this evidence that says if-then rewards are not that effective for more complex creative things, why do we keep deploying them for everything? Right. Remember, these if-then rewards have been effective for a long time. What happened is that what people are doing has changed, and yet how we're motivating them hasn't changed, and they're easier. They're totally easier. If I say, ooh, I'm your boss, and I say, hmm, what can I do to put Guy in the right position so he has sufficient levels of autonomy in the way that he wants? How can I come up with better mechanisms inside to give Guy feedback more regularly, information on how he's doing so he has a sense of making progress? How can I show Guy that what he does here every day makes a difference in our organization, makes a difference in our world? That's hard. If I say to, hey, Guy, your ratings go up, I'll give you a $10,000 bonus. Yeah. You, I just got Guy's attention. Yeah. Guy psyched. I walk back to my office, pat myself on the back for being a charismatic leader. And so these if-then rewards are really easy. And so I think for those reasons, we get seduced and, again, use them for everything rather than where they work. Can I still get the 10000 bucks? No. <laughs> Daniel Pink, he wrote all about this in his book called Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. Check out his full talk at ted.npr.org. Uh, I want the 10,000 bucks. Uh, we all want the 10,000 bucks. I want the 10,000 bucks. I want that the motivate me. Yeah? Yeah. Why did I come in here today? Do you, are you guys paying me? Uh... <laughs> what is the one thing that money cannot buy? Despite the best efforts of social scientists and humans throughout history, I think the one thing money really has not been able to buy us is love. I can't buy us love. All right, so the Beatles were right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it can't buy happiness, obviously, right? It can, oddly enough. It's just the way we usually use our money doesn't seem to do much for our happiness. So this is Michael Norton. He's a professor at the Harvard Business School. And how could money buy happiness? Here's how Michael explains it in his TED Talk. So I want to talk today about money and happiness, which are two things that a lot of us spend a lot of our time uh, thinking about, either trying to earn them or trying to increase them. And a lot of us resonate with this phrase. So we see it in religions and self-help books that money can't buy happiness. And I want to suggest today that in fact that's wrong and that 
<laughs> I'm at a business school, so that's what we do. So that that's wrong. And in fact, if you think that, you're actually just not spending it right. So that instead of spending it the way you usually spend it, maybe if you spent it differently, that might work a little bit uh, better. And, and before I tell you the ways that you can spend it that will make you happier, let's think about the ways we usually spend it that don't, in fact, make us happier. We had a little natural experiment. So, so CNN a little while ago wrote this uh, interesting article on what happens to people when they win the lottery. Turns out people think when they win the lottery, their lives are going to be amazing. This article is about how their lives get ruined. So what happens when people win the lottery is, number one, they spend all the money and go into debt. And number two, all of their friends and everyone they've ever met find them and bug them for money. And it ruins their social relationships, in fact. So they have more debt and worse friendships than they had before they won the lottery. What was interesting about the article was people started commenting on the article, readers of the thing. And instead of talking about how it had made them realize that money doesn't lead to happiness, everyone instantly started saying, you know what I would do if I won the lottery? <laughs> If you're lucky enough to win $5 million and you get that huge <laughs> giant check, which would be amazing. Yeah, sounds great. We as social scientists would treat everyone who won $5 million the same. We would say, imagine that you won $5 million and one person bought a hot air balloon, one person used the money and gave it all to charity, one person put it in a pile and burned it. Now, there's no way at the end of the year that those three people would have had the same year. And yet, on their income tax return, it would say they had the same year if all we looked at was the amount of money they had. And the very simple intuition we had was, I bet what they did with the money probably matters in terms of how much happiness they got out of it. Let's look at what people do with their money and see if it makes a difference. So the first way that we did this on uh, one uh, Vancouver morning, we went out on the campus uh, at University of British Columbia, and we approached people and said, do you want to be in an experiment? And they said yes. We, gave, we asked them how happy they were, and then we gave them an envelope. And one of the envelopes had things in it that said, by 5 p.m. today, spend this money on yourself. So we gave some examples of what you could spend it on. Other people in the morning got a slip of paper that said, by 5 p.m. today, spend this money on somebody else. So what did they do with the money? So imagine you got $5 or $20 for yourself today in an envelope from a stranger and they said spend it on yourself. Okay. You might think you'd do something interesting and unusual with it, but what we found is, you know, if you got $5 or $20, the first thing you do is you kind of put it in your wallet and it just becomes business as usual. And that's exactly what people did. They bought stuff like makeup and they bought things like a coffee for themselves. They just used it on things they would usually buy. And what about the other people? People who we told to spend on other people did different interesting things. So, uh, for example, one woman bought a stuffed animal for her niece. Many people gave money to homeless people. They gave money to street performers. And we think that part of what happens is it makes you think about your money differently than you usually do. It's as though it's a totally separate account of money, and you make sure you follow through on that. So at the end of the day, you called them up, and you what you ask them? We said on a scale from 1 to 10... How happy are you right now? Simplest question we could think of. If I asked you how happy are you on a scale from 1 to 10, most people in America and in Canada where we did the study will say something like 7, 8, or 9. What we find is that people who spent money on themselves, they're the same as they were in the morning. In other words, there's no real impact to spending money on yourself. It's not They were bad. 7 in the morning and that in the evening after they spent the money on themselves were a 7. That's exactly right. But it turns out that people who we gave money to spend on somebody else those people, if they were a seven in the morning, they're kind of like an eight now. It doesn't make them the happiest person in the world, but it does have consistently, in experiment after experiment, a positive effect on your happiness to spend on somebody else. How do we know that like this wasn't some weird like Canadian anomaly? Like Canadians are nicer than Americans. First you called Canadians weird, but then you, then you saved it by calling them nice. No, no, so gonna, no, they're not weird. We're neutral now no, on no, Canadians. No, no. no, just a weird Canadian phenomenon is what I mean. <laughs> Got it. Great question. So uh, these were college students who were you know, enrolled in a university. They live in North America. Their lives are pretty good in terms of the distribution of human outcomes. And we really wondered, you know, could it be the same if you were actually struggling to meet your basic needs? We did a study in Uganda, among other countries. We went to Uganda and did a very similar experiment. We asked people to think about spending on themselves or spending on somebody else. And we asked them, what'd you do? And then we asked them how happy they are. And even though Uganda, on average, is an incredibly much poorer country than Canada, we still see that spending money on yourself doesn't do much for you. 
and spending on other people seems to have an impact on how happy you are. So this is a quantifiable fact. Like if people spend it on other people or on charity, it will make them happier. Like that's true. That's an absolute truth. We see it in in so many countries in the world now, and we see it in so many contexts from people's private lives to consumers buying products that have some sort of charitable component to employees spending on each other rather than spending money on themselves. We've seen it in so many domains and across so many contexts. It really does seem like, on average, spending on yourself doesn't do much, and spending on others does something for you. Just because it disrupts your business as usual, buying the same things every single day for the rest of your life, it makes you think differently about money, and it makes you think, maybe I could do something for somebody else. What we see again, though, is that the specific way that you spend on other people isn't nearly as important as the fact that you spend on other people in order to make yourself happy, which is really quite important. So you don't have to do amazing things with your money to make yourself happy. You can do small, trivial things and yet still get these benefits from doing this. Start yourself on the process of thinking, again, less about how can I spend money on myself and more about if I've got $5 or $15, what can I do to benefit other people? Because ultimately when you do that, you'll find out you'll benefit yourself much more. Thank you. Michael Norton, he teaches at Harvard Business School. His book, co-written with Elizabeth Dunn, is called Happy Money. Check out his talk at ted.npr.org. Hey, thanks for listening to our show on The Money Paradox this week. If you missed any of it or you want to hear more or you want to find out more about who was on it, you can visit ted.npr.org. You can also find many, many more TED Talks at ted.com, and you can download this program through iTunes or through the NPR smartphone app. Our program was produced by Jeff Rogers, Brent Bachman, Megan Kane, Neva Grant, and Sanaz Meshkanpour, with help from Daniel Shukin, Portia Robertson-Migas, and Eric Newsom. Our intern is Rund Abdel Fattah, Thanks to our partners at TED, Chris Anderson, Jude Cohen, Darren Triff, and Janet Lee. I'm Guy Raz. You've been listening to Ideas Worth Spreading here on the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, thanks for listening to the show this week. If you're still looking for another great NPR podcast, check out Fresh Air with Terry Gross. Fresh Air interviews are a great way to get to know people like Jon Stewart, Larry David, Amy Poehler, Louis C.K., Michael Keaton. I can go on and on and on. You can find Fresh Air's podcast at npr.org slash podcasts or on the NPR One app.